Hello everybody, um, my name is Andrew Knight. I'm a uh, veterinary professor of animal welfare and this presentation is a little bit about um, certainly the globe trotting adventures that I've had in animal welfare during my career and also uh, a bit about uh, options available for people who would like to pursue uh, advanced studies in animal welfare academically uh, and also for veterinarians who are interested in becoming veterinary specialists in animal welfare in various regions of the world. So I'm originally from Perth, Western Australia, one of the most isolated capital cities on the planet in the southwest corner of Western Australia, as you can see down there. Perth uh, has the best beaches in the world, I would say. Um, it's a stunningly beautiful city, as you can see. Uh, but unfortunately, Perth does have a dark secret, which is a real problem in animal welfare terms. Uh, it um, is arguably the world capital of the live export trade. And when I was uh, a young person there, um, the trade was the biggest in the world. We shipped about 5 million uh, sheep per year, mostly uh, from Fremantle, which was the port of Perth City, where I was living, to Middle Eastern destinations. And this uh, sea voyage would last around about two and a half weeks, typically, which made it the longest uh, sea voyage in the world, apart from the voyage from New Zealand. And because of poor conditions on the ships, unfortunately, 100 to 150,000 uh, sheep would die at sea each year, with large numbers also dying on arrival in feedlots in Middle Eastern countries. So these uh, sh sheep would uh, travel through the streets of Fremantle and Perth in the giant um, sheep trucks on their way to the uh, sheep ships, which are up to 14 decks high, often uh, converted car carriers and other old ships. Uh, indeed, the live export fleet is the oldest marine fleet in the world. The average age of the ships is around about 30 years, so they're often not in very good condition. So uh, I was involved in the mid-1990s in helping to establish the Australian campaign against the live sheep trade. I could see with my own eyes the uh, condition of these poor sheep as they were being transported in trucks down to the docks and loaded onto the ships and clearly there were uh, disastrous animal welfare problems occurring in the live export trade. Um, we were very successful at the time. We got a lot of media coverage about the live export trade, really raised, raised a lot of public awareness about this issue. Uh, very sadly, one of the livestock uh, carriers caught fire and sank at sea uh, one year, killing around about 70,000 sheep on board. Uh, these accidents sadly do happen from time to time. As I said, the ships are the oldest marine fleet in the world and conditions on board them are often uh, uh, somewhat hazardous. So uh, following that, we uh, organised the protest through the streets of Perth City, where literally tens of thousands of people uh, joined that protest. Australia's Prime Minister had to uh, get involved and issued a statement to the effect that if Australia had had its time over again, it would not have chosen to uh, embark upon the live sheep trade. However, the country was now making so much money economically, certainly the farming sector from the trade, that uh, they had no intention of giving that up. Now, I found myself at the time um, basically uh, giving a lot of media interviews about the trade and I would give the facts and figures and describe what the welfare problems were and that would all go very well uh, up until uh, the interviewer would invariably ask me that awkward question which was, so Andrew, uh, what do you do for a living? And I had to answer that, well, I deliver pizzas, I deliver newspapers, or I deliver patients because at one time I was an orderly in a cancer treatment clinic and we would collect patients from the local hospital, transfer them to the uh, radiotherapy clinic for their radiotherapy treatment and back to the uh, hospital beds. So people uh, were obviously judging what I had to say about the live sheep trade on the basis of the fact that I uh, didn't have any special uh, standing to be speaking about the trade. I wasn't an expert in anything particular. So I started to seriously think about uh, how I could set myself up long term uh, to be able to advocate for the welfare of animals but also be taken more seriously by uh, stakeholders in society and indeed by radio interviewers. 
And I realized that if I really wanted to influence a large number of people, then the best choice that I could make would uh, obviously to become a movie or a rock star. Uh, but sadly, I had the wrong kind of hair and my singing voice was terrible. So I was forced to uh, look at uh, plan B options and I considered a number of uh, different professions, uh, which would have all been, I think, uh, worthwhile uh, professions to pursue. Uh, from a perspective of trying to advance the welfare of animals in various different ways. But I settled on veterinary medicine because I thought it would be fantastic to be um, helping animals and uh, their people on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, fixing broken bones, helping uh, animals with their medical problems. And also I realised that this would give me uh, advanced knowledge of uh, all sorts of animal welfare issues and of course the standing to be taken seriously when I advocated for the welfare of animals within society. And so I studied hard um, and successfully made it into the veterinary school at Western Australia's Murdoch University which was one of the few American accredited uh, veterinary schools uh, around the world at that time. And as you can see uh, it was a beautiful campus. This was uh, Bush Court and the uh, central part of our campus in the early mornings there would be rabbits hopping around uh, the campus there and we even had uh, some kangaroos in the bush down at the back of the campus. So a lovely place but once again sadly it um, was not quite as idyllic as it looked at first glance. Um, I rapidly uh, was drawn sideways into a campaign to uh, be able to complete the veterinary course without harming animals in my veterinary training in uh, preclinical subjects such as physiology, biochemistry and anatomy and also uh, in veterinary surgical training in the surgical and clinical final years of the course. This was ultimately successful I'm, I'm very pleased to say and we succeeded in setting up uh, an alternative surgical training program whereby uh, students didn't have to practice surgical procedures on healthy animals as my classmates here um, were doing uh, before killing those animals at the end of the procedure uh, whilst they were still anaesthetized. Instead, uh, in our alternative surgical program, we sourced um, animals that needed uh, sterilizing or other beneficial procedures from uh, private veterinary clinics and animal shelters, and we conducted those surgeries uh, under close one to one supervision, uh, returning those patients to their owners or for adoption. And we ended up getting around about five times the surgical experience of our classmates, um, which put us in a very good position actually when we started our careers as new graduate veterinarians. We had a lot more uh, competence and confidence as well starting as new graduate veterinarians. Uh, we also um, set up a policy within the entire university, a conscientious objection policy, whereby the university formally recognised that some students may conscientiously object to certain activities in their teaching or assessment such as uh, harming and killing animals and the university agreed to make reasonable efforts to establish alternatives for those students. That was very successful and uh, was also adopted by other universities within Australia and internationally. Um, after veterinary school, um, I finished at the end of 2001. Um, I went to the United Kingdom and worked as a small animal vet, so looking after cats and dogs and other uh, small pets. Um, as a locum veterinarian or per diem veterinarian, so that meant that I would fill in when people were on holidays, uh, maternity leave or ill. Um, and I ended up being a long-term uh, locum for a particular company that had uh, around about 10 or 15 branches. So uh, that provided me with uh, steady income and a lot of work uh, but also significant time off every year and this was useful because I uh, started to conduct additional studies uh, into um, invasive animal use in scientific research and teaching and the alternatives that were available. And I ended up uh, using this time uh, because I wasn't working all of the year to publish quite a lot of uh, studies which led to ultimately my book, uh, The Costs and Benefits of Animal Experiments, uh, in which I critically uh, assess the usefulness, the utility of invasive animal research and uh, have quantified the contributions of that to human healthcare advancements and also described the alternatives that were available. 
and I also did a lot of uh, examination of uh, educational animal use and alternatives. So that was published by Paul Grave Macmillan in paperback and hardback uh, respectively and that also uh, led to a PhD actually in this uh, area which I received from Griffith University, one of Australia's leading universities in 2010. And uh, one of the highlights of that actually was taking my uh, PhD uh, supervisor out to dinner in one of the um, downtown restaurants in Brisbane, which I was told was expected of uh, PhD students when you successfully passed your uh, examination, you're expected to take your supervisors out to dinner. So that was absolutely uh, fine. And we were sitting in this um, alfresco uh, outdoor restaurant watching these amazing uh, fruit bats fly in across the Brisbane uh, sky, uh, skyscape uh, after sunset. And these, these uh, flying foxes were enormous uh, bats, fruit bats, uh, like I suppose uh, flying home to roost. And they had very large wingspans and that was really one of the unexpected and interesting aspects of getting a PhD from uh, Griffith. Uh, so I do recommend Griffith University for this and many other reasons as well. It is one of Australia's uh, leading universities. Uh, after uh, my PhD, I went on to present my work at a series of conferences around the world. I was very successful at doing that, scientific conferences. And, and at the end of the first year, I discovered that I had burnt through 15,000 pounds of my own money traveling to and registering for uh, and designing and printing posters uh, to present at, at conferences and I realized that this was completely unsustainable. I discovered that normally uh, everyone else at these conferences was being funded by their universities or employers not by themselves. Uh, so then I had to change uh, my strategy and I decided to attend sort of about one expensive event per year and as many uh, cheap events as I could fit in per year. So I had to cut down the amount of uh, presenting that I was doing at conferences. Uh, I was uh, uh, very fortunate at one point to be asked to come to Peru by one of the animal rights organizations in Peru uh, and present my uh, talk on educational animal use and humane alternatives uh, in particular to around about six or seven uh, veterinary schools and many other venues across Peru uh, in um, 2013, January, I think it was. And uh, we gave about 20 presentations in two weeks. And every time I said anything, it had to be translated into Spanish by uh, this, this uh, lovely uh, assistant right next to me. And by the end of the two weeks, uh, she was able to deliver virtually all of my presentation in Spanish uh, with minimal prompting from myself, having repeated it around about 20 times. Uh, despite the language barrier, uh, this was an extremely successful trip. Uh, I ended up giving two or three presentations a day for, uh, for, for a lot of that time. In the middle, uh, the organization kindly gave me a few days off uh, and gave me a choice of going to either the Amazon jungle or up into the, um, the Peruvian Andes. Uh, which is the second highest mountain range in the world. And I, I chose the latter. So this is the uh, Cordillera Blanca, the White Mountains up in uh, Peru. And the, the mountain peaks there reach up to 7,000 metres, so the second highest range in the world after the Himalayas. Um, I, as I have been to these various conferences and indeed here to Peru, I have a habit of making side trips into the local uh, wilderness and climbing whatever mountains may be around or going on other adventures looking for I, I, I like to like to um, have the excuse that um, in theory I'm trying to find the local mythical animal whatever that might be um, there's an interesting uh, field called uh, veterinary cryptozoology which is uh, the medicine and surgery of animals that are considered to be mythical or extinct um, and so I, I, I like to pretend that I'm, I'm a trainee uh, veterinary cryptozoologist and uh, go searching for these mythical animals as part of my quest to provide them with uh, the veterinary care that they deserve as much as any other animals, if you think about it. Um, sadly, I've never actually succeeded in finding any of, the, uh, of these creatures that I've sought, but 
as they say, it's not about the destination, it's the journey that counts. And I've always had wonderful adventures uh, in, in my, my quests. So um, on this occasion, I t pretended that I was off searching for the South American Yeti. And I managed to get really high up into the, the mountains, actually, and had a wonderful adventure seeing some particularly uh, beautiful uh, lakes and uh, mountains high up in the Andes. Now, I've, I've often published my various travel adventures in the uh, veterinary press in the United Kingdom, and this is one of the articles about these looking for these mythical animals. In fact, I've got about 20 of those published uh, so far. So let me know if you're interested in seeing any. Um, I, I have tried to make them uh, entertaining. I think uh, we all spend far too much time uh, working very hard and being very serious for most of our lives, and it's nice to have a little bit of balance, I think. Uh, back to the serious uh, topics. Um, I also was able to set up various websites uh, providing uh, expert information on the issues that I was researching publishing on. So I set up uh, animalexperiments.info, which continues to be active uh, today. Uh, also humanelearning.info, which uh, provides all sorts of resources, particularly for students seeking to use uh, humane teaching methods within their education and needing guidance about how to raise that issue with uh, their universities and providing lots of useful resources to support them. Uh, pet food innovation uh, describes uh, vegan and other alternate uh, pet foods uh, for cats and dogs. And before you all uh, think I'm completely mad, uh, raising the topic of vegan diets for cats in particular, which we all know are biologically um, obligate carnivores, meaning that they uh, need to hunt and kill prey animals in order to be able to survive within their, their natural environment. I would point out that uh, earlier in 2021, uh, just recently, so when I'm recording this presentation, uh, there was this wonderful article that was uh, published in the veterinary press in the United Kingdom, which referred to this new research article uh, in which uh, Sarah Dodd and colleagues from Guelph uh, Veterinary School in Canada uh, studied uh, 1,325 vegan cats. Um, and the owners also provided information about, uh, sorry, I should say 1,325 cats, of which some were vegan. Uh, the owners provided information about the previous cats that they had owned, and you can see the lifespans of the previous cats here. Um, the plant-based cats um, were on the right-hand side in green, and as you can see, they, they appear to be living longer than the cats based on meat-based diets and mixed diets. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference in the lifespans between these animals. However, the vegans certainly were not living any less I should, I should come back and say, um, they found in their survey of uh, 1325 cat owners that the uh, owners of vegan cats were more likely to report them as being in very good health than the owners of meat-based cats. Uh, and they also found that the vegan cats reportedly had less uh, problems with obesity, gastrointestinal problems and liver problems than the cats on meat-based diets. Uh, with respect to other health parameters, there were no significant differences between the, the uh, two groups or three groups. So this is the first large-scale population study of the health of vegan cats in comparison to meat-based cats. Uh, it's just been published. It shows very clearly that the uh, reported health of the vegan cats was at least equivalent to those of the meat-based cats and in some respects was actually better. So um, yes, it's certainly... Uh, contrary to what uh, we uh, might intuitively think about uh, what these obligate carnivores need to eat, uh, it does demonstrate the point that providing you provide to them all the nutrients that they require within their diets, uh, they don't need meat or any other particular ingredient. Of course, nutrients and ingredients are different things. Uh, you do need to provide them with all the nutrients they require. Uh, I was also able to uh, help out the uh, Animal Welfare Party in the United Kingdom. Uh, this was a political party with the aim of putting forward the interests of animals into the political sphere and encouraging other political parties to uh, realise uh, that th they matter to some voters, uh, demonstrating this through the 
um, number of people that voted for the party and its policies and helping to, I suppose, advocate for the welfare of animals and for policies which uh, genuinely uh, protected them and advanced their welfare. So I was uh, asked to be a uh, electoral candidate in national and European parliamentary elections for the Animal Welfare Party around about four times and, and that uh, invariably went uh, very well. Although, of course, we didn't come close to, to winning anything, but we did succeed in raising the profile of animal welfare uh, within politics and um, encouraged, I think, the other political parties to improve some of their policies with respect to animal welfare, which, which was the point. In um, 2013, I was recruited actually to go here to Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine, which is one of the world's largest veterinary schools in the Caribbean, on the small Caribbean island of St. Kitts, which uh, is uh, just below this uh, towering volcano you can see rising up on the right hand side. Um, the entire Caribbean island chain is a volcanic island chain. Uh, Ross University was one of the world's largest veterinary schools and I was uh, the director of the clinical skills laboratory teaching uh, clinical and surgical skills to our uh, very large veterinary school cohort. I think we we're about the second largest veterinary school in the world at the time. Um, starting in the first semester of their studies with uh, simple manual skills, instrument handling skills, um, psychomotor skills to build up their hand-eye coordination and building upon those skills uh, every semester all the way up to the surgical training stage of their curriculum. And this was very successful uh, when the students would go to mainland uh, veterinary schools in the United States with large teaching hospitals and large caseloads to complete the final clinical year of their courses. Uh, we would get the feedback that our students were considered particularly well prepared with respect to their surgical and clinical skills. So we're very uh, proud of the success of the Clinical Skills Laboratory at Ross University. Um, so, more importantly though, um, because this is uh, something of a light-hearted presentation, uh, I'd like to show you some of the amazing photos I took when I was in the, the Caribbean. So, this here is the uh, view from the temporary accommodation I was uh, placed into on arrival in the uh, Caribbean. I had to deal with traffic going back and forth in front of the windows, as you can see here. I was often disturbed by unexpected visitors. And this is uh, the veterinary school itself. Uh, this is the main uh, courtyard, I suppose you would call it, uh, overlooking the Caribbean Sea. And indeed, uh, down at the bottom, this is one of the cafes where the students and staff would eat their lunch uh, overlooking the Caribbean Sea. In time, I was removed uh, out of the temporary accommodation into uh, a more permanent rental uh, flat here overlooking this almost private uh, beach that was Calypso Bay, very beautiful uh, place. Uh, I didn't get my own swimming pool, I had to share this swimming pool, uh, this infinity pool about 50 feet up above the Caribbean Sea and uh, from the edge of the pool you could look down in the sea and occasionally see sea turtles actually surfacing on the water below. So it was all a stunningly uh, beautiful place. As I said, the um, university was just underneath a uh, volcano which uh, wasn't entirely dormant. Uh, we would smell whiffs of sulfur gas sometimes in the campus. Uh, we climbed into the crater of the volcano a few times, which was a pretty epic adventure, I have to say. It involved descending uh, jungle covered cliffs around about 150 meters. Uh, using a series of old rotted ropes after climbing a, something like about 800 meters up I think um, and there would be scalding hot steam issuing out of vents in the crater of the volcano which was pretty much hot enough to put, uh, cook popcorn on and we know this because uh, we indeed uh, tried to do that. I have to say it didn't taste very good and I, I don't recommend volcano uh, cooked popcorn uh, to anybody. Um, as you can see, we're very serious people at the university, so we took our uh, health and safety responsibilities uh, very seriously. In case this volcano did ever explode and uh, threaten the veterinary school, we had an evacuation plan which involved us uh, evacuating along the coastline. As you can see in the direction of the arrow, we would practice 
uh, our evacuation drills uh, on a weekly basis, in fact more than once a week for some people, some people were particularly keen. Um, and we would get to the end of the island where, where there was this beautiful peninsula as you can see and we would run this 10 kilometer route looking at the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the Caribbean Sea on the other all the way along this amazing peninsula around this sunken volcano, whoops, sunken volcano up here at the end to the end of the island where this jetty would appear and in theory if the lava was still coming for us we would then jump off and swim to the next island which is Nevis you can see out there uh, or in, in the left hand shot you can see it at the end of the uh, photograph. So that uh, swim was actually about four kilometers and once a year there was actually a race uh, between the two islands and uh, well over 100 people would enter the swimming race. Um, when I turned up um, people asked me just after I arrived would I be joining them on the inter-island swim in a, in a few weeks time and two people in my section uh, were doing it and one of them was pregnant and the other one was a lady over the age of 50. So I kind of didn't feel as a young man that I could really confess the truth which was I was too frightened to, to contemplate uh, this swim so I said of course I'll, I'll happily do the swim with you and I proceeded to desperately uh, train by swimming back and forth along uh, this bay here trying to build up my um, endurance. So the big morning came and I was lined up at the start line along with everybody else who was in the the B grade the slow group uh, we were allowed to take um, um, a mask and snorkel and flippers to make it a bit easy for us if we were in the B group and the lady on my left who is uh, a radiographer at the university and became uh, one of my best friends casually told me that on the previous year just as uh, she was about to start the crossing she saw a 12 foot uh, hammerhead, hammerhead shark actually when she was swimming across so I spent the entire swim anxiously scanning left to right looking for this 12 foot hammerhead shark um, and I, I never saw the hammerhead shark uh, I trust the shark is, is uh, healthy and happy and still out there somewhere what I did see however was um, I was part way across um, worried about this shark when I heard this, this, this scream so I stuck my head up and one of the other uh, swimmers was, was screaming sea turtle sea turtle so I stuck my head down again and photographed this. Uh, I took with me a small uh, waterproof compact digital and uh, all these, this photo is, is one of my own. So there was this lovely sea turtle down there and we um, swam with that for a while and then we finally got close to the destination after zigzagging across the, the sea and variously getting lost from time to time. There were lots of sea kayaks out there who were trying to keep track of us and rescue us if, if we needed it. Um, in fact I was, I was swimming along at one point and when your head is down between the waves sometimes you can't see land and I'm swimming along and suddenly a paddle appeared right in front of my face and I stuck my head up and the sea kayak said no go that way and I realized I'd been heading for South America so I, I did appreciate uh, the guidance that they provided. So anyway I having been redirected I successfully uh, made it towards uh, my destination. I was nearly there when I found these guys uh, swimming across uh, my route at uh, right angles, these wonderful spotted eagle rays. So of course I had to completely abandon my, my route entirely and, and follow them for as long as I could. So that destroyed my uh, time, which I have to say was not competitive anyway. I think I was beaten by uh, everyone uh, at my university probably. Um, but I, I followed these uh, spotted eagle rays and had a wonderful time before finally uh, arriving at the shore. So as you can see I had lots of wonderful adventures in uh, my animal welfare career uh, at Ross University. I did manage to get animal welfare inc included in four different courses in the Ross curriculum uh, by the time that, that I left there so I was uh, pleased with that. Uh, then I was recruited to go to the University of Winchester and uh, set up a new centre for animal welfare. University of Winchester is a beautiful medieval market town one hour south of London and it's one of the most historic uh, little towns in the United Kingdom. It used to be the capital of the uh, ancient country of Wessex 
uh, and which expanded really to become uh, England eventually and indeed the United Kingdom. So it's a very historic town, lots of beautiful places around the town. Uh, the cathedral there is the longest one in the country uh, and it has this wonderful open air ice rink that uh, sets up uh, during winter. Uh, I was brought there to set up a new centre for animal welfare at the university and one of the most exciting uh, projects there for me has been to establish uh, our Master of Science program in Animal Welfare Science, Ethics and Law which is entirely distance learning. We also have uh, undergraduate degrees in Animal Welfare, uh, Human Animal Studies, Conservation and Related Fields all within the Centre of Animal Welfare. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be involved with my colleagues at the uh, University of Winchester Centre for Animal Welfare in all sorts of interesting research projects. I'll just share a couple of them now. Uh, we uh, actually, th this particular project, the first one there about the wildlife trade in Southeast Asia, uh, grew from one of the master's level dissertations. Occasionally the uh, dissertations that our master's students submit are so good that we recommend that uh, they be submitted for publication in scientific journals, uh, sometimes with uh, further input from ourselves. And in this case, our student Shannon Rivera uh, successfully uh, interviewed a whole bunch of stakeholders in Southeast Asian countries to look at the barriers to, to better care and disposal of uh, confiscated live animals that were confiscated as part of the wildlife trade and often end up in very poor conditions or uh, prematurely killed. So. Uh, she looked at the barriers to providing better care for those animals and we recently published that article in Journal Animals, which is one of the top journals in the animal welfare field. I've also uh, been involved in, in an exciting review of the all of the published evidence in all of the different academic journals about the effectiveness of humane teaching methods versus harmful animal use when teaching uh, veterinary surgery or other life and health sciences subjects at university or secondary school level. And we found 50 studies actually looking at uh, how the learning outcomes differed using the two different methods conducted at all sorts of universities around the world. And we found that in 10% of the cases the humane teaching methods uh, produced uh, worse learning outcomes. In 60% of the cases they produced uh, equivalent learning outcomes and 30% of the time humane teaching methods actually produced better learning outcomes than uh, methods relying on harmful animal use. So we've just published that uh, also in the journal Animals. This was one of the particularly interesting uh, projects that I was involved in. Uh, I attended um, a, a lecture, uh, a guest lecture uh, given by uh, a colleague who was a um, historian of crime in Britain. And uh, one thing led to another and we decided to collaborate on a study into Jack the Ripper. I had been um, intrigued when I was taken on a mystery uh, Jack the Ripper tour for my birthday a few years ago by my lovely wife. And I was a little bit uh, almost insulted by the, by the theory that Jack the Ripper might have been some kind of surgeon because he was very skilled at uh, killing his victims stealing internal organs and disappearing into the night in a very short space of minutes. And that's not something that a beginner can do. So there were theories that he, he might have perhaps been a surgeon, maybe even a veterinary surgeon, maybe some kind of deviant ancestral colleague of myself. And uh, I was you know, offended by, by uh, the thought that uh, any, any veterinary surgeon uh, could, could do something so absolutely horrible and appalling. So. Um, I, I actually was struck by the case of victim number four, Catherine Eddowes, and this poor lady um, was actually murdered in uh, a place called Mitre Square in East London in uh, late 1888 um, after midnight. And there was a police constable that went through Mitre Square uh, twice uh, within about a 15 minute period. I think it was about 2 a.m. And in that 15 minute period, Jack the Ripper managed to lure this poor lady into uh, one corner of the square, kill her, um, remove sufficient clothing, make an incision, open up her abdomen, steal one of her kidneys and disappear into the night, all within 15 minutes. 
Um, if we were to do this as veterinary uh, students to an animal in anatomy uh, studies in first year of our veterinary course to try to locate the kidney and remove the kidney, uh, this kind of procedure, I mean our anatomy labs would usually last about three hours. It's not something a beginner can do quickly. So uh, I found it very interesting that uh, he could do all this also uh, at ground level, not with the luxury of uh, an, a dissecting table. Uh, under very poor light, it was there was a sort of an, a gas street lamp in one corner, I think, uh, and the lighting was very poor. And do this also speedily. So as I said, there was a theory that he must have been a surgeon, but I looked at these pathology diagrams of Catherine Eddowes uh, from the 1880s, and I noticed there were these stab incisions here, uh, just very close to the edge of uh, the main uh, opening of her abdomen. And I realized that, um, sorry for the horrible pictures uh, in this presentation, um, when the, you make an incision into the skin of the abdomen, the skin edges spring apart because they're under tension. And the edges then become sort of loose and flaccid. And it would be very difficult to then make a stab incision really close to the edge in parallel, as, as we can see a couple of them close to the edge of this main incision in parallel on the victim's body. So that indicates to me that probably these stab incisions were not made when the skin edge was loose, when the uh, main incision had already occurred. Probably the skin was taut, it was tight and the uh, main incision had not yet occurred when these stab incisions were placed. Probably what occurred was these two stab incisions were made and then a third one was made which was then extended to become the main incision. There were probably, there appear to be three major cuts here, one, two, three. The interesting thing about this is the direction of opening the abdomen is opposite to the direction that we are taught as surgeons in, certainly within uh, veterinary school, to make our incisions. We're, we're taught to make our incisions at the, at the xiphoid or, or the umbilicus area down towards the groin, not in the other direction. The second thing to note is this incision is all over the place. It's very far off the midline. We are taught to stick very much to the midline uh, within our veterinary surgical training because uh, the midline is where the uh, fibrous fascial sheaths surrounding the abdominal muscles, you can see them, them here, they come together, these capsules surrounding the muscles, they come together forming this white uh, fibrous band. It's called the linea alba or the white line in Latin. And it's we're taught to cut through this rather than say cut through the muscle because this is avascular. It doesn't have blood vessels in it so it won't bleed and bleeding is dangerous for the patient and also obscures the first surgical field so the surgeon can't see what they're doing. And also, it's very tough, so when we're closing it up afterwards, we can place our sutures within this white line, and the sutures will hold instead of pulling through softer tissue like muscle. So we are taught to stick very closely to this white line. It's very important that we do so. And this is drilled into us so much that it becomes automatic. So I was struck by the fact that these uh, deviations were so far from this central point. Uh, if this had genuinely been a surgeon making these incisions and somebody surgically trained, it's hard to imagine that they would have been so far from that central line, even if somebody had been uh, working under conditions of poor lighting and, and in a hurry. So these uh, two points made me think that actually this surgical approach was not consistent with uh, the approach of anyone who had undergone surgical training. By the way, uh, the direction of this main incision is consistent with the direction of opening uh, the abdomen of an animal in a slaughterhouse after the animal has been shackled and hung up by its hind legs. And that is done to remove the uh, abdominal contents. So um, I wanted to see if uh, human surgeons were trained in the same way as veterinary surgeons with respect to this because I'm a veterinary surgeon, not a human surgeon. So I had to go to the Winchester Library and ask for the assistance of the librarians in tracking down human surgical texts, which uh, we duly did. 
But what about um, the time difference? Because Jack the Ripper was operating in the 1880s. So how was surgery taught back in the 1880s? So I went back to our uh, library assistants and said, could they find me surgery text from the 1880s? And again, they rose to the challenge. Look at this. Uh, principles and practice of surgery from uh, 1886. But what about veterinary surgery? Because that is different. So perhaps he could have been a veterinary surgeon. So I had to go and find a veterinary surgical text from the same era. And none of this, none of these texts contradicted the theory that I had that actually the surgical approaches used on these victims were not consistent with someone who had gone undergone either veterinary or human surgical training. And there were a range of other characteristics of these crimes. Uh, the misspelling of the word kidney in one of the notes left by Jack the Ripper um, and various other uh, characteristics that make it uh, very unlikely he'd undergone any degree of medical training. And in fact, we know uh, from modern sociological studies that the rates of serious and violent crimes spike dramatically in communities around slaughterhouses because there's something d intrinsically desensitizing I think about killing large number of animals uh, every day and that seems to spill over into um, the likelihood of committing uh, violent crimes uh, toward people um, after hours. In East London in the 1880s uh, there were no uh, refrigerators, there were no industrial scale slaughterhouses outside of town, there were no um, trucks. So uh, people did eat an awful lot of meat and uh, the animals were uh, brought into markets in the centre of London and they were killed in small scale slaughterhouses all across uh, London, especially East London, where Jack the Ripper committed his crimes. Indeed, uh, the first victim was found about 150 metres from one of these small-scale slaughterhouses. So uh, we published a theory that Jack the Ricker, Ripper was probably a slaughterhouse worker because of a range of reasons, from surgical approaches through to uh, sociological aspects, through to historical aspects, through to linguistic aspects. So I guess it's amazing uh, where a veterinary degree can take you uh, is the moral of that story. Uh, we published uh, this uh, 10,000 word academic paper uh, in which we think we solved uh, the professional identity of Jack the Ripper, if not the individual identity of Jack the Ripper. So uh, those are some of the interesting uh, research projects that I've been involved in in the last several years and a whole bunch of others as well. Animal welfare can be an amazingly diverse and interesting field. So why should you become a professional animal advocate? Well, given my career, um, this is me uh, on one of the uh, islands on the uh, Great Barrier Reef just after picking up my PhD at Griffith University in Queensland in, in 2010. I would see clearly uh, it looks like you'll never have to, to do any actual work if you believe that photo. You get to travel around the world. Uh, these are all my photos from some of the amazing places I've seen, often when I've gone to conferences on animal welfare around the world. You get to uh, go to some amazing parties, uh, network with some really interesting people, eat lots of fabulous uh, food. Um, I've gotten to see all sorts of wonderful castles, mountains, beaches, and so much more in my literally globetrotting career in animal welfare that I've had over the last... I suppose 20 years. So of course what are you waiting for? You'll never have to do any work, you'll get to see the world, become an animal advocate, become a professional uh, specialist in animal welfare. But seriously, if you look at the opportunity that you've been given in terms of having a lifetime here upon planet Earth and you ask yourself how can you do the most good? How can you make a difference? What's, what's the best impact that you can have during your time here? I think it's wonderful to do something like be a veterinarian in practice. You get to help you know, hundreds, thousands of, of individual animals and their people on a day-to-day -day basis. There are so many other careers that are rewarding and worthwhile too. But if you are serious about maximizing your positive impact on the planet during your time upon the earth, I think you need to be looking larger scale. I think you need to be looking 
at uh, something where you can be an advocate for large numbers of people or animals or the environment on a much larger scale than just looking at individual animals or people or whatever it might be. So animal welfare specialists uh, like myself get to work on issues that uh, affect the welfare uh, and the life interests of uh, thousands or millions of sentient animals. So that I think is uh, why you should perhaps consider becoming uh, a specialist in animal welfare. It's one of the ways that you can do the most good during your time on Earth. If you are interested in becoming an, an animal welfare specialist, um, I'd like to talk now about the options to become a veterinary specialist in animal welfare if you're already a veterinarian in the United Kingdom, Germany, Europe, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. And then I'd like to talk about the postgraduate training programs in animal welfare um, for vets and also for non-veterinarians as well. I've summarized um, a lot of what I'm going to say now in this article, which is uh, available on my website. It's, it's very slightly out of date in a couple of these small details, but it's still mostly applicable. It was published in 2014. You can find it on my website, andrewknight.info. Within Europe, the first uh, specializations in animal welfare for vets were established in the United Kingdom in the 1990s. The uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons certificate and diplomas in the uh, discipline were established. You can see within the UK, it's not just animal welfare, but it also includes ethics and animal law. Uh, the first certificate was awarded in 1995. Certificates in general are the first level of postgraduate uh, qualification other than being a general veterinarian. They signify special expertise and experience within uh, an area, whether it be animal welfare, medicine, surgery, any of, uh, any of the other veterinary uh, specialties. The next level up and the highest level of expertise is the diploma above the certificate. <clears throat> the first diploma in this field was awarded in 1997, um, sorry, approved in 1997, and the first two of them were awarded in 1999. This is the level of uh, qualification that's necessary to become a uh, recognized veterinary specialist in an area, so a veterinary specialist in animal welfare in our case. Today, however, enrollments in the uh, RCVS certificates and diplomas in specialty fields are no longer accepted. Instead, we have the RCVS certificate in advanced veterinary practice, which can be tailored to people's interests, uh, for example, in animal welfare, although there's a lot of commonalities uh, which can't be tailored. And we have the European-wide diplomas now as well. Within Europe, let's look at Germany, because Germany does have its own uh, animal welfare specialist uh, route for veterinarians. The different uh, German uh, states and provinces uh, um, vary. Uh, these, this information relates to uh, Berlin. To become a veterinary specialist in animal welfare within Berlin, you must work in animal welfare for the equivalent of four full-time years. You have to, must have a supervisor who's already a specialist, attend workshops and conferences on animal welfare and ethics, publish two or three related articles, uh, academic articles that is, as first author, and pass an oral examination of around one and a half hours. Now, as I run through these different countries, you'll see that a lot of these criteria are repeated. So this gives us a good idea of the sorts of things that are likely to be necessary to be an animal welfare specialist anywhere. The European Diploma is actually a subspecialty in animal welfare science, ethics and law. You can see once again we don't just have animal welfare, we've also got ethics and law within the European College of Animal Welfare and Behavioural Medicine. And you end up with this very long-winded dip all those letters after the dip. So if you are into collecting letters after your name, this is a good one to get. Um, it is the European equivalent to the United Kingdom Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Diploma. Uh, this was provisionally recognized within Europe in 2011. You can do a standard residency, which would normally follow a one-year internship. Generally, for all of the veterinary specialties, there is meant to be a one-year internship. And then if you do well in that, 
you might become eligible to do a three-year full-time residency, regardless of whatever the field may be. So the same principles apply here. After your internship, uh, to do the standard residency program, you do a three-year full-time or equivalent part-time, for example, six years part-time, approved uh, residency program, which must be supervised by an existing college diplomat. At the present time, because this field is, this veterinary specialty is so new, there are almost no um, approved residency programs, unfortunately. If you already have significant experience within animal welfare, uh, you may be eligible for an alternative residency program where you can personalise it to your needs. So if you uh, know uh, a lot about X and Y, but nothing about Z, uh, you may wish to set up a program that uh, enables you to learn and get experience in Z. You need to do three years of full-time or equivalent part-time experience. The whole lot must be completed within seven years. Must This alternative program that you propose just for your, your own personal needs might be different from everybody else's alternative, must be approved by the European College, has to be supervised by an existing college diplomat. Further information is available from the European College about the requirements. In the United States, we have the American College for Animal Welfare, and in this case, there's no ethics and law uh, attached to that. It's just animal welfare. Uh, this was recognised as a vet, new veterinary specialty college in 2012. Uh, they have both the training route and the alternate route, similar to the standard and the alternative residencies within Europe. To do the training route, you have to do a college-approved training program, such as a residency. And again, there's almost no approved residencies. I think we, at the present time in uh, 2021, we have about one residency program that's been approved uh, within the United States and only just recently. Uh, so there are very few of these. The alternate route similarly allows you to design a personalized training program to meet your uh, particular needs under the guidance of uh, a college diplomat. Uh, after, toward the end of their training, candidates may apply for credentialing. So you submit a credentialing packet uh, detailing your qualifications, your experience, uh, everything you've studied in the field of animal welfare. This is assessed by the credentialing committee. Uh, and if you are successful, you'll be permitted to proceed to take the examination. Uh, so it's not automatic. Um, you then have a maximum five years and three attempts to pass the examination. You also need two first author publications on animal welfare topics. And further information is available on the ACOR website as well. What about Australia and New Zealand? Why should you become a veterinary specialist in Australia and New Zealand? Well, as I said, we do have in Australia the best beaches in the world. It's a beautiful country. You'll get to see amazing, unusual animals uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's a great place to be. If you are into mythical animals like myself, you can go looking for uh, wonderful animals like the Tasmanian tiger. I have to say that sightings of this long extinct uh, animal uh, keep on being reported in the media about every 10 years or so at the end of some farmer's field uh, abutting onto wilderness. Somebody thinks that they've seen something that looks like a Tasmanian tiger or a suspicious skull is found, which seems to be the skull of a Tasmanian tiger, uh, which is only, um, which certainly is not a hundred years old uh, or so, which is um, what it should be, but more like uh, 10 or 20 years old. So um, hmm, Tasmania's got an awful lot of pristine wilderness out there and there are ongoing uh, theories about the uh, continued existence of the Tasmanian tiger and occasional sightings from time to time. So there you go. If you want uh, to go off on an adventure, the Tasmanian wilderness is some of the best in the world. Uh, it's a very mountainous, beautiful island. Uh, we walked across the centre on one of the long distance hikes uh, back in, I think, uh, around about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's a spectacularly beautiful country. And just maybe you'll spot the Tasmanian tiger as well. So another good reason to consider Australia uh, for your uh, to living location and as a place for your career. If you want to do this, well, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Certificate and Diploma were the progenitors of the Australian equivalents, which is membership and fellowship of the chapter on animal welfare within the Australian New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists. Uh, the chapter was established in 2000. Membership in animal welfare is a bit like the uh, certificates in the United Kingdom. It's the first level of uh, postgraduate qualification. It signifies 
expertise and competence in the discipline, but it's not sufficient to be called a specialist in the discipline. To do this, you must have uh, four years of experience as a vet, successfully completed both written and oral examinations, uh, normally available every two years. This is the normal pathway to become a member. The next level up, uh, which is sufficient to become a specialist, is the fellowship. Uh, as with Europe, we call it animal welfare, but also ethics and law. Uh, it indicates scholarly and technical excellence. It's designed to meet and exceed the prerequisites for registration as a veterinary specialist. You normally need to uh, have previous membership of the college in animal welfare. Uh, you need to complete a formal or personalised alternative training program, i.e. residency. So once again, we're seeing the two different routes, the um, normal residency program or the personalised residency program, as we've seen in the US and Europe. You have to pass fellowship examinations, and this time you're asked to provide three uh, relevant peer-reviewed publications on uh, topics relevant to animal welfare, ethics and law. At least one of these must describe an original project other than a case report for which you had primary responsibility. And further information is available from the animal welfare chapter within the Australian New Zealand College. So if you are a vet or a non-vet and you want to gain um, postgraduate level uh, knowledge of all of the different animal welfare issues and experience, uh, there are a range of master's programs available for you now. Um, here's uh, the one that I established at the University of Winchester in 2015, uh, our MSc in Animal Welfare Science, Ethics and Law. We cover these modules, uh, one year full-time or two or three years part-time. In the uh, 12 weeks times two within Animal Welfare Issues 1 and 2, uh, we cover virtually all of the Animal Welfare Issues, uh, giving you a good understanding of what the major welfare concerns are associated with the use of animals in all sorts of farming systems, transportation, slaughter, animals in laboratories, uh, zoos, uh, entertainment settings, companion animals, wild animals, working animals and others. We also have a lot on animal behaviour within uh, two modules, uh, one here and one above it. Uh, we cover normal animal behaviour and also pathological behaviours and this is important to the assessment of welfare, the identification of pathological behaviours uh, when animals are placed long term in uh, stressful environments uh, is an, can be an indicator of poor welfare for those animals. We also start to talk about some management strategies for pathological behaviours such as environmental enrichment, uh, even retraining, desensitisation, pharmacological treatment. Uh, and, and others. We also have a fair bit here about um, uh, morally relevant capacities of animals, so those uh, capacities such as the ability to experience fear, stress, pain, also positive uh, mental states, the ability to have social relationships with other animals for social species, communicative abilities, uh, the capacities of some animals to uh, display empathetic behaviours, altruistic behaviours, uh, to have a so-called theory of mind, which is the ability to uh, understand the likely goals and intentions and anticipate behaviour of other animals, to engage in um, behaviours such as uh, deception, advanced memories and so on. All the sorts of uh, characteristics of animals that uh, might be and often are considered important to discussions about whether they should be considered morally um, worthy of protection by people. Of course, the big one today is sentience. Which animals are sentient? Uh, what does that mean? So a lot of that's discussed here, and it's a basis for us uh, considering the interests of animals and for uh, creating laws and policies that protect them. In this first module here, half of the module is about animal law, major animal legislation in uh, the United Kingdom, Europe, the United States and some other regions of the world. And also there's an introduction to animal ethics um, and the viewpoints of different stakeholders surrounding animals, the evolution of uh, animal welfare concerns uh, within societies and over time. We also cover communication skills uh, and that may be advice for the different assignments that we have, uh, academic writing, popular writing, publishing blogs, uh, creating academic posters, creating uh, PowerPoint presentations and delivering those and more. 
Uh, we also at the end cover things like uh, there's, there's a module on uh, research methods which leads into the final dissertation which is a very big research project resulting in a, uh, a large dissertation at the end and so occasionally there's a good enough to be published in academic journals in the field. So we aim to give our students three things uh, in this program. Firstly, a detailed knowledge of all of the different animal welfare issues. Secondly, uh, a really good set of communication skills so that they can go out into wider society and take their knowledge and use it to help to bring about positive change for animals by engaging with all sorts of different stakeholder groups and communicating in different ways. We think communication is really important. Thirdly, of course, uh, a qualification to help them to be taken seriously by uh, different stakeholders in the media within society when seeking to advance the welfare of animals. Um, this um, curriculum for our master's program was actually um, set up by myself to map onto the curricula being used within uh, Europe and the United States for veterinarians needing to study for the specialty examinations in animal welfare. So for any veterinarians wanting to pursue those qualifications, uh, this uh, curriculum actually provides them with uh, pretty much everything they'll need to cover for those examinations. And as I mentioned, we give these uh, key transferable skills as well, guidance in design and conduct of research project, uh, academic communication of results, and more modern communication channels. We ask students to publish one blog during the course and uh, one uh, presentation uh, converted into a movie and uploaded to YouTube. So every semester, an awful lot of uh, blogs, some of them very good, and also short presentations on animal welfare issues are appearing on uh, the internet, which is fantastic. University of Winchester is uh, not a really large university in the United Kingdom. It's not as old as some, but we aim to be world leading in terms of our values. We're uh, one of the leading universities uh, for the study of uh, environmental sustainability issues and social justice issues, uh, in including animal welfare. Uh, we aim to encourage serious critical examinations of all sorts of contemporary uses of animals. And I feel that uh, in many of the other animal welfare programs that exist around the world, this isn't done enough. Uh, there is discussion about what the animal welfare problems are in all sorts of different settings where animals are used. But the next logical step of whether those procedures ought to be going ahead at all whether some animal use practices ought to be banned or severely modified, uh, often is not undertaken in a very serious way. So we um, welcome those sorts of discussions within the University of Winchester in our animal welfare programs. This seems to resonate particularly well with the goals of many people who are working or aiming to work in the animal welfare and advocacy sectors. And our program uh, is very popular. We get uh, nearly all, all of our students want to go on and have those professional careers. My master's program is entirely distance learning. It has been since well before the COVID pandemic. It has been since uh, its beginning in 2015, uh, which has pros and cons. Uh, I think the benefits uh, far outweigh the disadvantages. We include all sorts of YouTube video clips of animals in different settings. Uh, and when we discuss their welfare, we can bring in guest speakers from anywhere in the world. Our students don't need to spend any time commuting. They can view recordings of uh, lectures at times that suit them, suit them. So it saves a lot of time for everybody. It's more convenient for students. Uh, we do lose the face-to-face -face communication, which is a shame, but we have our virtual uh, lectures and webinars and, and seminars and sometimes guest speakers uh, as well. Occasionally we do have uh, physical events. We have guest lectures at the university and we encourage as many students as possible to come to those and to meet uh, ourselves and one another. Uh, our program is available through part-time enrolment options as well for those who are uh, continuing to work whilst studying. Uh, our costs are very competitive. Um, the 2021 cost to do the entire master's program is £6,800, which seems to be less than half of one of the other major programs in the United Kingdom. And I think there's uh, one of the very few comparable programs in the United States costs about 30,000 US dollars. So very competitive uh, financially. 
If you don't want to do the full master's program, uh, you can do the postgrad diploma for two thirds of the modules and two thirds of the cost, or postgraduate certificate for one third. Within the United Kingdom, last time I checked, there were uh, around about 12 other courses that all fo focus on animal welfare um, and related fields that people can consider doing as well. People could certainly look at these. Um, there is the Masters of Science in Applied Animal Behaviour and Animal Welfare at the University of Edinburgh, which is one of the oldest centres for the study of animal welfare in the United Kingdom. It has a very well regarded and well established program up there. That's certainly you know, a fantastic option. I understand they, they charge a lot more uh, than we do, um, but it's a very good program, I'm sure. Um, we have Newcastle University, Queen's University, Belfast, University of Lincoln, Hartbury College, and probably others now as well. So uh, there are other options available too, and many of those are very good universities. Some focus on conservation. Uh, the ones I mentioned previously often focus on animal welfare and behaviour. These ones will often focus on animal welfare and conservation. University of Bristol, Glasgow, Nottingham, and so on. Some of these um, may have actually stopped and new courses will have been put on. So if you're interested, take this as a starting point, but do your own check um, of current availability of programs. Around the world, uh, outside of the United Kingdom, there are some other programs too. The UK certainly is a global centre for the study of animal welfare, and that's why myself and Australian from the best beaches uh, in the world, uh, and having previously worked uh, in the Caribbean, has ended up in a country of rain and clouds and uh, beaches that are sometimes made of rocks. Um, uh, that's why I'm in the UK, because it is uh, the leading centre uh, globally for the study of animal welfare. But uh, internationally, there are some other locations too. Uh, there, there has been a Master in Human Animal Interactions at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna, which I, I think is uh, very good from what I know of it. Uh, there has been a program at Guelph and also Tufts University coming School of Veterinary Medicine, also excellent university. So there are other options around the world as well. I'm about done with my uh, run through of my adventures in animal welfare. Hopefully that has encouraged some of you to, to consider careers in animal welfare. You uh, may be able to do the most good that you can do in a lifetime upon uh, planet Earth. But hopefully, uh, as you know, it's, it's so important to have balance, uh, to not spend all of our time working. And if you have a career in animal welfare, you can also see some wonderful places around the world and have some great adventures and uh, some fun as well. So that's really important. I'll leave you with this uh, final quote from His Holiness uh, Tenzin Gyatso, 14th Dalai Lama. Uh, it is not enough to be compassionate. It's not enough to care about the problems in the world. You must actually do something. You must act. I'd like to acknowledge um, those who have uh, assisted me during this uh, presentation today. Uh, the hammerhead, um, sorry, the, the green sea turtle I saw in the crossing uh, between Nevis and Sakits, the spotted eagle rays, and especially the hammerhead shark, who sadly I've, I've not met yet. And that is sad because uh, despite my, my cowardice, it would be a great privilege uh, to see one up close because sadly sharks are rapidly becoming extinct across the world's oceans due to uh, heinous overfishing by human beings and uh, pollution and destruction of natural habitat and fishery stocks that they uh, rely upon for their food. So I haven't seen the hammerhead shark yet. I very much hope that he or she is still happy and well and out there some, someday. And I do appreciate uh, this uh, shark's contribution as well to my presentation. So thank you very much indeed. Um, do, uh, I suppose, look at my website, uh, andrewknight.info, if you're interested in finding that article about uh, specialty options uh, in animal welfare for veterinarians in different countries. Uh, on my website, I've got all my articles available. Uh, there is um, a section on uh, animal welfare education, I think, and I think that's where the article is. Thank you very much.